Welcome back to the show. It is August 17th, 2023. Chaz Smith, welcome. I'm, ma- I'm making an Instagram post right now. Okay, cool. I'll, I'll filibuster. He's I'll vamp. Back um, is what my Instagram post says. Do you know who I'm it, talking about? Eric Logan? He's back. Back on social media? Well, he has a new job, David Lee Scales. Did he get it through LinkedIn.com slash surf? He sure did. That's how it popped up into my feed itself, linkedin.com slash surf. Before we talk about Eric's new job, can I tell you something about LinkedIn, David Lee Scales? I would love to hear it. And I don't even know. Is this even a paid advertisement? I don't even think it is. I'm just saying this. The, I mean, it is. It is technically they are on board for the next year. Great. Well, okay. So I should have done this when they came on board at the start of the year, right? I should have thought, huh, I should go check my LinkedIn. So I did go, though, uh, last night, and I have no idea why, but I decided, you know, I'm going to go check my LinkedIn messages. I had a lot of funny messages from, like, five to ten years ago that I was responding to. Sorry it took me ten years to get back, but dot, dot, dot. Yeah, good stuff. But how does Eric Logan relate? Well, so there I am minding my own business. Bing! get a LinkedIn notification. We have Eric Logan back in the building. Let me find what it says real quick. Uh, it says... Congratulate him, I think. I mean, yeah, it's like he congratulated himself, right? It was like oh, okay. uh, popping popping stuff, like uh, party poppers in there. Hold on, let me just finish this up real well, quick. Well, I'll tell you what I saw. I saw it said, congratulate... It, like it, it prompts you... To, reach to congratulate out. him. Yeah. yeah, basically. So it says, congratulate Eric Logan for starting a new position, which Boom, I was excited. I was excited, so excited to see. I'm like, man, this guy's quick, right? Must have gone to linkedin.com slash surf and posted a job, posted hit that he needed a job and boom, they did their magic. But where is he employed? He is Eric Logan. Shoot. I got to find the exact wording because that's the important part. I'm just His go role, here. his role and his place of business he is living life at self-employed <laughs> <laughs> that is the exact in bold highlighted role and position he is funny i started my uh beach grit i'm just gonna read from my beach grit story today since it i felt so good about it when i was writing it i was just giggling to myself as i wrote when not making people feel Uncomfortable with unwanted amorous advances or telling beloved professional surfers that he would ruin them or berating Brazilian champions in scathing open letters, Eric Logan's reign atop the World Surf League was marked by whimsical, silly goose behavior. And this is exactly what this is. Whimsical, silly goose behavior. He's just being a funny guy. The silliest of all the gooses. (laughs) I mean, can you imagine? You, David Lee Scales, are an adult male. You are a father. You have a family. Can you imagine going on to LinkedIn and just making little jokesies? I am starting a new position, living life at self-employed. I mean, again, not to cast aspersions on Eric Logan's fine and sterling character, uh, but this sort of feels like an idea that might seem good under the influence of alcohol to go mm. on, to have like a I'm gonna be goof I'm gonna be goofy guy right now I'm gonna be a funny goofball living life at self-employed there are definitely those times um intoxicated times in my life where I know not to post on social media. I know to not even reply to text messages yeah. after a certain hour. You know, it's like, this can wait till tomorrow. It only has risk for me at this point. Yes. Like, I mean, I don't know. And I would hope this is probably a tools to live by. Uh, every person listening to this podcast, if you are of drinking age, it never is good. Like that idea that... Um, the zinger or the funny thing or whatever it is. Now I'm going to go with a, I'll give it like a one in a million. You'll wake up the next morning and read your text or your thing or your social media post or whatever it is and say, you know, that was as 
funny or good or potent uh, as I thought it was. Totally. Well, yeah, I would say just put the phone down. After a certain level of whatever you're doing, bong rips, <laughs> acid drops, uh, cocktails, put the phone down. You don't need unless, to more. Unless you're Joel Tudor. Then please, as you were. Well, it's on brand. You know, there's yeah. <laughs> certain guys who, yeah, you just give them a free pass. Or, or it's actually what you want to hear from them. Yeah. Um, I'm curious. We need to do some forensic analysis on what time was that posted on LinkedIn? Was it last night at 11 p.m. is the question. I mean, can you can you see? I'll, I'll get on there and check later. Okay. Yeah. Um, I mean, that would be because uh, obviously when I got it here, let's look. Let's just look. I have it saved to my photos. I enjoyed it so much. So I can just rip right in here. And let's see. Uh, it was one hour ago when I when got you screenshotted it. it. Yeah, so it was like early afternoon. Oh, okay. Well, that's yeah. I can see I him mean, going forward early in the afternoon. Well, I'm saying like, <laughs> but it's not doing, Who knows what you're doing when your position is living life at self-employed? When I first read it, I just glanced, and then this. I believed this for the next hour until I reread it. I thought he said living large at self-employed, <laughs> <laughs> which I was like, wow, that's hilarious that he would post. Like he's really going for the silly goose thing, but he didn't say large. The, uh, the bungled grammar of it, like living life at uh, self-employed, which I'm assuming it was just a change in his bio somewhere, right? Like you say, yes. your position and your company. And so Correct. he didn't write, write that. But the, the, the way that bungled grammar comes up, I had to pause and wonder if living life uh, or, or, yeah, if living life was some company. Like I thought, oh, oh Eric, yeah. Eric Logan got on, which, again, would have made sense. I thought he got on like some speaker series or something. He's doing, yeah. you know, as an ex-Oprah Winfrey executive, he's doing, uh, yeah, like whatever kind of uplifting talks. Right. Well, the other big news this week was uh, you had a birthday. I had a birthday. I had Shout a birthday. out. Happy Thank you. birthday. Thank you. How old are you? Big one. I'm 47, which I wouldn't have known otherwise, but a friend told me a couple weeks ago, he said, wow, you're turning 47 or something like that. And I said, I am. And then really had to crunch the numbers. And yeah, I'm 47. I have to do the math all the time. I, I'm always within no one... I'm usually within one year, sometimes I think two years at the most, but usually within one year, but I have to actually do the math every time. At this point, I have, I'm like a good three to four, could be a good three to four off Crazy. either way. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And because it just stops mattering. It, I mean, what is the difference between 46? I mean, truly, what is the difference between 48 and 44? There's Nothing. no difference. Zero. Yeah, no like difference. you get to the milestones, I suppose, the 40s and the 50s. And then at least there's like something to hang your hat on. But once you yeah. pass the milestone, it's like, it's all the same diff until the next milestone. Which is a decade. Within yeah. a given decade, it's fine. Either yeah. you just, yeah. Whatever. Um, uh, yeah. What, I got logged out of my Facebook forever ago and have not been able to log back in. So I'm sorry if you follow me on Facebook and wished me, or if we're friends on Facebook and you wish me a happy birthday and I was just stony cold, I apologize. Um, you'll check it in 10 years like you did LinkedIn. Exactly. Oh, that was, it was such great pleasure, like responding to people. I'm so sorry. It took me so long to get back to you. <laughs> 10 years on. Uh, would your career had advanced if you were actively engaged on there in the last 10 years? So I was sitting giggling uh, in bed, reading these messages from 10 years ago and responding. And the wife uh, looked at me and couldn't even be mad, but was just like, basically... You are a giant butthole. You get to live your life where you don't have to be uh, like directly engaged in anything and just move along. Like the rest of us have to actually respond to messages and actually LinkedIn matters and yeah. we need to use it and we build connections through it. And if we miss messages that can impact our life negatively and it probably did impact my life negatively as well, but it's just a real giggle fest for me. There's some movie opportunity for a book that you had written or something. You know? it, it was that kind of stuff in there. Yeah. Inquiries about stuff. Yeah. Oops. That's funny. 
Well, I'm going to kick it off with uh, Tools to Live By today, presented by Veyer Watches, which is the only tool that you need. VeyerWatches.com, right there, Chaz, has got it on display. Uh, promo code SPLENDOR15 for 15% off. Veyer, spelled V-A-E-R. Um, we love them. But the tool, the advice that I need from you is whether or not to wish somebody a happy birthday. I saw that it was your birthday because your wife wished you well. And I thought to, on Instagram and I thought to myself, this is an opportunity to reach out. And then I thought, what's the protocol here? Is a phone call necessary? Is a text sufficient? Should I do a handwritten card that I mail to his house? It's going to show up a couple days late, but it'll have more impact at that point. Or do I save it for a podcast segment on Friday or Thursday? So he, this is a wonderful, this is way less, uh, what? Way less, we're not going to get in trouble for this one, like we are <laughs> going to get for men riding shotgun while their wives drive. But Lots of so, feedback on that. We can address it later. Great. Uh, but the, so for me, typically, I am kind of a grouse when it comes to birthdays. My, my own personal birthday, right? Like, don't, don't care about it, you know, not really, et cetera, et cetera. And my normal advice, probably my 10 year ago advice would have been, who cares? Just let the day go. You know, that person, you'll talk to them if, you know, when you think about them or when something comes up, their day they were born is immaterial, right? And now with this older age, at this 47 years of, of age, I can think it is like, these times are special, even if they don't feel special to you. It's a nice time to kind of, I don't know, take stock of all the... Is that me? That was you. Dang it, I might not sleep. How's that? I have silence notifications. It's rude. Bummer. Uh, yeah. But in any case, like, it's just, it is a nice time to take stock of those in your life who matter, right? And so I'm going to say... A simple text suffices okay. in terms of a happy birthday, right? Just letting the person know you're thinking about them. No more, no less. Don't need to wax eloquent. Don't need to go into great detail. I think that's the, it's just a small marker of, you know, and not for you, not for the sender. I'm sorry, uh, for both, for the sender and the sendee, I think. When okay. people have birthdays. Both sides can take stock of, oh, look, at we have these special relationships in our lives. Ain't that grand? All right. Well, I'll try harder next year. Thank you. But You're welcome. Yeah. Um, for listeners who are typing in a barrel or NOS submission, I just would like the record to show that we have already done posting about your significant other on Instagram. We've already done self-identifying that it's your birthday, either on Instagram or in the workplace. So go back to previous year's shows if you would like to hear the answers to those. We've done a lot of work on birthdays here because it is important. And But again, it is important to readdress because these things change over time, right? I mean, I'll hold on whatever we said about announcing your own birthday. Man, announcing your own birthday is really not very cool. I feel like uh, females, not to um, get in trouble again for identifying genders, <laughs> but I feel like females have a little bit more grace with this. Like sure. it, it, I, you know, I'm used to seeing Queen for a day with the big two five balloons for the 25th birthday on Instagram, and then a gallery of photos, cell blowing out candles and celebrating that night. I accept that. I'm not offended by that. When a dude does it, though. Mm. I do get a little bit like, I'm not offended by it, but I recognize that that person does need special attention. Like yeah. they're seeking attention. For some reason, the female seeking attention, I don't know. I, it doesn't, it's, I don't know. I have no idea why that's a, uh, why I give more grace for the female I'm, in that scenario. I'm glad because I, I did think that we were not going to get in trouble for answering this question, but now we can. So that's great. <laughs> But I well, totally, I totally agree. When I when I see a peacock, a man who needs attention, I mean it's just true. And I really, puppets of the manosphere right here. But uh, we are. I mean, are it, it is what of it the is. Manosphere. But it's yeah. but my manosphere that I'm a puppet in. You know, I like my men stoic. I like my men. You know, not like completely stoic, but I don't like a preening. 
I need attention, man. I agree. Yeah, it feels weird. And maybe yeah. it feels weird because we're being confronted by evolution. Like maybe that is the better way. Maybe we're evolving into a way where the male who needs attention or is more vulnerable and showcases his vulnerabilities or whatever it is, is better for society and better for the human race. And you and I are, you know, stuck toxic. in the old and not comfortable. Yeah, we're toxic and we're stuck in the old and we're not comfortable with change. But that's a very real possibility, which I should I should read Griffin Colapinto's recent Instagram uh, in relation to this, but I'm going to save it for a little bit later. Um, I do want to say, though, that so very strangely, this place, this podcast, while it's seemingly um, flippant and uh, a toxic environment and irreverent and all of that, I think it's actually the most civil place right now in surf media because we discussed the husband sitting shotguns last week, sitting shotgun last week, and um, Maybe it's because we've set an expectation for irreverence and for comedy, but or just being self-effacing and even like being willing to take heat from people. Uh, but the feed people chime in afterwards with their opinions, but rarely do they actually attempt to tear you and I down. Yeah. They, they give us feedback and they say, wow, I disagree with you. Here's my thoughts on it. But they never, rarely do they ever come at you and I and like, holy cow, you guys are awful human beings. I'm never listening again or I'm going to try to cancel you or anything like that. They chime in and they say, like I said, either I agree with you or that was funny or I disagree with you and here's why here's I why. feel the way that I feel. It's become civil discourse. I've, I have learned and grown so much from this podcast, from our conversation, of course, but then the conversation with uh, the listener. Like, totally. You know, exactly what you said. I get thought provoking DMs or emails or messages regularly, and especially when I've crossed the line. Uh, and even the one from, I mean, we'll get into it, I suppose, the, even the one from the Committee for Women's Surfing Equity, the Committee for Equity in Women's Surfing. Uh, that message DM was, you know, calling you and I puppets of the manosphere, but also had in the middle that I left out, uh, something about your interview with Paige Alms. They like when they liked when Paige Alms corrected you. What did Paige Alms correct you upon? Oh, um, I think I said, first of all, she didn't correct me. Um, but I think maybe what they're referring to is I said, it was pretty cool. Like we were talking about the limitations of having, um, the, you know, uh, men, the men's events at jaws and then the women's event at jaws and running the women in lesser quality surf or whatever it was. And so I said, it feels like a step in the right direction for the eddy to have an open division where the men competed against the women, uh, like in the same, in the same heat, women yeah. and men in the same heats or something like that. And she said, well, you know, that has inherent problems as well. And then she went on to explain what she felt was unfair about that. But I don't Great. think she was correcting me. I gave my opinion on something and she gave her opinion on something. But Great. Uh, but all to say, though, even the Committee for Equity in Women's Surfing slash Surf Equity, I don't mean to den name them again, but... Uh... <laughs> What goofballs talk about silly gooses. Uh, but yeah, they listen to the they listen to the show. Yeah. Yeah, I mean apparently because I feel like they've chimed in in the past and complained about something too, right? Yeah. Um so first of all, did they wish you a happy birthday? Did Surf no, Equity reach Surf, Surf oh, Equity okay. did not wish me a happy birthday. So when they complained about whatever it was last week, did they was there a direct message with uh with this civil discourse or was it simply them posting an article that they tagged you in? Uh, they DM me so, like something about, yeah, exactly. I think I posted the DM or did I, maybe I just, I didn't, I didn't see any message from them. Oh yeah. They messaged me and said, you are homophobic. Not only, not only was your conversation about men riding shotgun while they're women drive, uh, sexist. It was also homophobic because you didn't consider same sex couples, which is amazing to me. Yeah. <laughs> as if, as if, as if when we talk about anything, we need to discuss every possible person who could be involved in the thing. You know, I mean, many, many times we discuss, let's say a CT event 
and we only discuss three people who surfed in the event. <laughs> we don't discuss everybody who surfed in the event. Um, but it's funny, I clicked over onto Surf Equity's Instagram page to see kind of what it was about. And I actually related to a lot of it. You know what I mean? Like I, I thought this is somebody who has a very specific or maybe a group of people who have a very specific ideology in mind. And in kind of conjunction with that, they want to hold power to account. Like I have these ideals. These are the things I'm interested in. These are the things I don't feel represented in and or my group doesn't feel represented in. And so I'm going to hold power to account to kind of acknowledge the way that I see the world. And I felt like I get it. Like I feel that way personally in the surf world at times. Um, but then I also felt like, wow, they're really misidentifying an enemy here. Yeah. Like to to identify us as the power that needs to be held to account, which by the way, maybe I'm wrong. Maybe they're right. Maybe we do have a certain position of power by having this podcast or whatever. But um, I also consider us an ally. Like you guys are completely mis surf, I surf equity are totally misunderstanding either not only our roles, but our where our heart is at. Like, cause I feel like I would be your ally had this conversation started off on a different foot because I actually agree with all of the things that you are about. And the conversation that Chaz and I were having last week, you either misunderstood what where our hearts were at in that conversation. You didn't get some of the joking that was happening in that conversation. You know what I mean? Like a certain their, I don't know, perspective on world, their worldview, let's say, may have blinded them from uh, fully understanding the nuance of the conversation or something like that. I mean, I think anybody who thinks is a zealot and thinking they are right 100% of the time yeah, opens that. themselves up for trouble. And I think that's what surf, whoever the people are, feel, right? It is their way or the highway. And there's no middle ground, right? There's no way for coexistence. There's right and there's wrong. There yeah. is, you know, and the, and yeah, like I'm sure they try. Uh, the weird thing about them, I think, is that they bully uh, women mostly, which is really weird. Like Cal Kenley is listed as a founder, but they have a whole thing on their website. Their website's a mess if you ever go there. It's kind of a funny thing to go through. But uh, they have a whole thing about Cal speaking out against like trans inclusion and in sport i think basically like keala saying something about you know like it's unfair essentially uh and then like roasting keala and so she is no longer part of our thing but they still have her listed as a founder but it's that kind of thing right it's like these are all nuanced discussions i think like especially you know this trans inclusion in sport is not it's not black and white there is and we've beaten it to death probably on this show but Anybody who says, no, this is 100%, I'm 100% right on this issue, so like, you're a crazy person. This is all wildly new stuff, and it's a, you know, I mean, my goodness, to think that you are the end, the arbiter of knowing 100% this is right and this is wrong in this issue, you're dumb. Shows a, shows a real arrogance and also a real misunderstanding of the word equity. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, truly the opposite of equity. Yeah. And I mean, maybe it's time that we just redefine in the way that we've redefined literally. Yeah. Doesn't mean literally anymore or couldn't care less. Doesn't mean what that, you know, like equity is now meaning I'm equity, right. You're wrong. Exactly. Equity is the n most narrow definition of what I feel to be right. Exactly. Exactly. Um, well, what did, keeping on the theme of birthdays, uh, what'd you get and how'd you celebrate? How did your wife celebrate for you? My folks drove down, surprised me. They got a nice, uh, a wonderful fountain pen, a good, like classic fountain pen, not a ballpoint pen, fountain pen, which as I got it, I realized I'd, I've never owned a fountain pen myself. And I thought this wow. is silly that I have not owned a fountain pen. And so I think, yeah. I think it's an important tool to live by it, as well as a Vera watch as a fountain pen. So I got a great fountain pen, book, uh, some other stuff, and then why we went out for a fine steak dinner at night. Beautiful. Yeah. What cut did you order? It was 
a uh, it was like was it a T-bone? Prime? Mm. T-bone I think strange choice mm, that was a strange choice now that I think about it it probably wasn't a T-bone <laughs> Um, all right. Well, do we discuss the Dave Prodan sticker? Is that fair game at this point? Sure. Yeah. Okay. Stick, stickers are popping up at Lower Trestles, apparently. I've been yeah. hit up like three or four times now. Chaz just texted me right before we started the show this um, Dave Prodan sticker, which is incredible. Um, Dave Pro, what is it? What does it say? Dave Prodan killed surfing with an image of Dave Prodan. <laughs> It inspired you. It looks like a bumper sticker, essentially. This inspiring message brought to you by actual surfers. And my response to you was, last man standing will take all the blame, right? You're, exa- you're exactly right. I mean, poor Dave Prodan, right? Dave Prodan, though, we have, he is both poor Dave Prodan, but he, now he's also, we've talked about it. He is, like, implicated in every disastrous way that this World Surf League has turned, right? Like, He cannot, he is the chief strategy officer at this point. He can no longer wash his hands. His hands are filthy. And Dave Prodan, if there's one thing I know about Dave Prodan, Dave Prodan was there, and I've mentioned this before, a decade plus ago when I first started covering professional surfing or surfing in general. Yeah, the first time I ever went on tour, Dave Prodan was there. Brody Carr, CEO, Dave Prodan, right there. Dave Prodan is still there. Dave Prodan has been through regime change he has been through ceos dropping like flies he has been through everything dave prodan is not going away he will be the last man standing he will turn out the lights and it will be his fault he already is the last man standing dave i mean prodan for, killed surfing. let's put it this way for the previous however long we've been doing this podcast five years we've pointed to dave as the salt in the building so dave actually got the accolade along the way It was always us blaming the corporate suits who didn't understand surfing for the missteps of the WSL. But we'd always go like, well, as long as there's salt in the building. And Pat was there for a while, so that was great. And Devin was there for a while, so they got credit for the good things. And Dave always got credit for the good things. But at this point, it's not just complicit. It's not like, dude, well, those people left when they saw the writing on the wall. And and they didn't... Yeah, I mean, ultimately, Devin Howard didn't want to jeopardize his street credibility. He went in there, they hired him for a street cred. He went in there thinking, okay, cool, I can give you guys direction and you can kind of benefit from my street cred and we can get the right surfers at these events because I'm here vouching for you, essentially, WSL, and promising those surfers that we will adjust the scoring to reflect, you know, the whatever. And when he realized his hands were tied, He exited the building on his own terms. And so for Prodan, and we've kind of pointed out the writing on the wall repeatedly over and over and over and over. And there was a point where Prodan started ignoring our writing on the wall and then even calling us, you know, saying that we're wrong or that we need to stop talking about it or that we're the problem or whatever it is. So there was a shift from Prodan being complicit into the things that were happening to now he's going to take all of the blame because people are going to, yeah, he's driving it. People are going to forget the impression that Eric Logan left. You know, he took all the blame for when he was there, but he's long gone at a certain point and Prodan's still there and he will rightfully or wrongfully be responsible. I mean, he is the last man standing takes the blame. You're exactly right. He will be the last man standing. He has been, I mean, you said it all. He has been involved uh, there and, You know, I've known a lot of people in and out of that World Surf League organization. Everyone, well, not everyone, but most that I talk to say it was one of the worst jobs they've ever had. That it is, it is, uh, super toxic, toxic, dysfunctional, like bad top to bottom, right? And Dave Prodan has thrived and I guess is, is that culture. He is part of that culture. He has created that culture. At this point, the stickers are already printed. (laughs) The evidence is in Dave Prodan killed professional surf, killed surfing. Um, And I would just love to know who printed these stickers. The sticker design is amazing. Yeah, the whole thing is great. I mean, the message, the photo that they chose, the yellow color is really eye catching. Like it is who's behind this. And to go down and slap them up, uh, 
right ahead of, I mean, these are all, or I've seen, maybe there are other places too, but the people who keep sending me images from them, it's all up and down the lowers trail or the right. trestles, the trail to trestles. So people are going to be seeing this, like as the, both the, you know, the tour is coming back now to all the, everybody will be there warming up for finals day. When is finals day again? Is it September, September 8th. Something? Okay. September 8th. Yeah. So, so people are going to be coming in, warming up. WSL, you know, I mean, the whole, everything's going to be there. Do, what do you think they do? Do you think the World Surf League will hire people to go take those stickers down? No. Uh, I mean, good good luck, by the way. There's stickers on the Trussell's Trail that I've seen there since I was a kid. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like, they're, they don't, uh, they're not very diligent. It's not like Laguna Beach or Newport Beach where they're going to be taking down graffiti or anything like that. And uh, the people who put those up are going to be right back tomorrow putting new ones up as well, I would presume. Do you think, how does Dave Prodan feel that he killed surfing? I don't anticipate that he is uh, contrite or believes any of it. But I think he, he has his reasons for why he's doing what he's doing and he feels, you know, justified in them. Does he think it's funny or does he, does it hurt his feelings though? I don't know him well enough to say. Hmm. I'm what do you say think? I know Dave Prodan pretty well. Uh, Dave Prodan is as even keeled a guy as you will ever meet. Right, he d doesn't have an up, and I have never seen him have a down either. He is, but he does love surfing, and I can imagine it hurts his feelings. Unless... If 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 the core community had shifted far enough to where they actually believe that he killed pro surfing well, or somebody... killed surfing, it doesn't even say pro surfing; it just says killed surfing. Yeah. So I think then, that would hurt his feelings. I think it. Jo I think these stickers that said Jonah Hill ruined surfing hurt Jonah's feelings. But Jonah has feelings that he wears very much on his sleeve. Totally. Prodan, again, if this, which talked bad about Pro Prodan on this show, to talk good about Prodan now, Prodan is the sort of uh, guy you would want in your company in terms of his steadiness, his even keelness, his always there-ness. He's just in the wrong company. That's the problem. And like, so maybe it's even rude to say, uh, Prodan should have jumped ship. Prodan doesn't have, I don't think, a jump ship part of his body, right? True. Feels like this was the path that was, or this was set in motion and it will never stop. And maybe that's what he thinks at the end. If it, if, if I killed surfing, well, I guess surfing was meant to die. Well, the other thing I guess that we could objectively point out is that whatever good he set out to do or whatever his vision was, he is not executed. No surfing is, I mean, so, I mean, ultimately if you're going to work in a place for your entire career, you would like to think that you left it in a better place than you found it. And I don't think that he could say that at this point. You know what I mean? I mean, what was the great Ronald Reagan speech campaign speech? Was your life better? Are you better off now than you were four years ago? Whatever. Uh, I think you can look at surf pro surfing and say objectively that it's in a real dump right like it's i mean aside from high quality broadcasts that's what they give us but even that's i mean oof, not to beat this dead horse again but watching chopu the amount of missed waves you like when they cut to a static commercial for the world surf league right on YouTube. And I, I assume that because that feed is going out and so that space needs to be filled with, or is actually filled with real advertisements, other places, just not on the world surf league's own YouTube channel. Yeah. I'm sure there's a reason there's not, they're not just going to blank screens for two minutes or three minutes at a time, but then coming back or interviewing somebody and you just see in the corner, the little bitty guy getting a great wave, right? And yeah. then you're thinking, if the, if you're not going to show this live, essentially, why are you broadcasting it live to begin with? If you're if you're right. missing, like a good thirty percent of the action, at least thirty percent of the action every time, why not just say, hey, look, we're gonna we're gonna make a package, we're gonna air it the next day, we're gonna tighten it up, it'll be you'll like it better, trust us. I mean, honestly, the whole thing needs to be reworked. And so even running commercials is based in an archaic format. We don't need to live by the standards that were set 15 years ago 
when we didn't have all the modern technology and whatever that we have now. You know, like if you're going to run a live event, then you need to run it live and you don't need to cut away to commercial and figure out how to structure the business in such a way that you don't need commercial cutaways. Full stop. That's it. Well, I don't, I mean, like, I don't understand how these are 30 minute heats, right? You, why is there a rule in the rule book that each heat has to start? Why don't you have like a three minute break in between heats where you run your commercials and then go back to your heat, right? Yeah, like, because again, the structure is archaic and it was set in place a long time ago and they haven't revamped the structure. The structure is such that they need a certain amount of time in a given day. And so they build out the structure based on that, not based on putting people in the best waves. And so that's kind of what I'm constantly harping on is Best surfers in the best waves. Build the structure for that. And that's never been the build. The build was, by the way, pre-internet. The build yeah. was, we need to map this out for 18 months from now. So let's pick a window that we think there might be swell and then structure an event. And then that's what the government's expectations are in the local the local government. We built them with these expectations so they don't know any different. You could instead build totally different expectations for them, for the sponsors, for everybody, with the focus being, we're going to run great surfers and great waves. And I posted an Instagram about this earlier in the week because Scott and I were talking about it. And I cannot believe the inane comments that people give. You know, like, and the premise was, look, we run, the men's tour runs 350 heats a year. Imagine that. 350 heats a year. How many of those heats are run in epic surf? Yeah, six. If even, I would yeah. say how many, if the question was how many run in good surf, then yes, yeah, six out of 350, how many are run in, you know, how many heats have excellent scores from both surfers in the course of a year, maybe 10, maybe 20 at the most, but I'd say probably 10 out of 350. So it's yeah. a waste of total waste of resources, totally poorly poor, programmed, totally needs to be reworked. Anyways, Chris Cote chimes in and says, I don't know, John John's 9.57 was pretty epic today. And I'm like, are you out of your mind? Like, that's that doesn't even have relevance to the conversation. <laughs> yes, it was epic. But do you remember what 8 to 10 foot Chopu looks like? Like, yeah. John John got the sickest wave of the day. And that was a, that, yeah, that was a great barrel. I wish I'd get a barrel like that at some point in my life. That's all neither here nor there. Do you remember what 8 to 10 foot Chopu looks like? It is a world different than what we're witnessing in this contest. And yes, this contest is the best waves that we've seen on tour this year. You yeah. know, like, okay, so compared to everything else that they failed to do this year, this is better. But that's not what we should be comparing it to, you guys. Throw it all out. Remember what it looks like when Chopu is 10 feet. It's insane. And that's what Gabriel Medina and John John Florence and these guys are qualified to compete in this is a dumbing down of their surfing what we're witnessing here is them nowhere near being challenged to their potential so this is a failure how much did how much of the chopu contest did you watch are we getting into the chopu Ab contest absolutely i'm gonna take back everything i just said it was a <laughs> phenomenal final <laughs> the final was phenomenal to watch and not not um not by any of the wsl's own doing like i'm not this this was just Gabriel Medina and Jack Robinson, uh, two surfers who are fully adept at, in those types of ways, implementing different strategies and seeing how those strategies play out against one another. And there were good waves in the final, not, you know, not good for Chopu, but certainly good waves and good compared to everything else we've seen this year on tour. Jack Robinson waiting for bombs, essentially, and Gabriel Medina out positioning him at the beginning, so getting an eight on the board, and then manufacturing scores and just it felt like gabe is dominating the lineup and even the commentators were feeding into that just like wow gabe's unstoppable this guy's a machine how's jack robinson and i'm thinking to myself no jack robinson's just waiting for a bomb you know yeah and that's ultimately what happened with it with five minutes left jack robinson got his second score and put Gabriel Medina back in second position to where Gabe stayed for the rest of the heat and Jack Robinson won. So it was a phenomenal final, the way it all played out. I mean, to me, so yeah, the the contest overall I thought was very enjoyable. Uh, yes. It was two, I think, I guess we can credit the World Surf League for the uh, 
cut was really good, right? I mean, having those less surfers, getting pr pretty much from the round or, you know, elimination round kind of feels like it goes quick now. And then you're at the end of the round of 16 yeah. and it, the whole thing feels like it moves a lot better now. It feels consequential. Uh, like yeah. each, each heat feels consequential. Except the problem is then when you get though, and there was, you know, it was fun to watch so many storylines, et cetera, et cetera. But it starts to feel empty after a while when you realize there's honestly nothing at stake except, you know, it's great. Who's going to win Chopu is that's, you know, stakes enough, I suppose. But in well, terms of the whole year, in terms of everything else, and I suppose them trying to make the stakes where JP Curry uh, addressed in his wonderful rap of like, the Kaipo voiceover thing of trying to gin up this final five thing, it just feels absolutely hollow. Well, that's what I thought where the final did feel important. And even the quarters or the semis, Gabe or Jack, whoever won that final had entry into the final five. Yeah. So that had stakes, you know, and that felt more meaningful than even winning the event was getting into the final five, which then gives them access into a potential world title. Except it doesn't, because look who goes in after failing to paddle once again. The number was Philippe Toledo at Trestles with, you got to beat him twice. It's not happening. Philippe Toledo is champion. Just grant it to him again. Unless he gets hurt, Philippe Toledo will be the champion. And that is that, right? This, this like, getting into the final five at at spot number five, who cares? Sorry yeah. about it. Like, you well, won Chopu. That's what you got. But... Totally. The final day concept we have discussed in the past, and I agree with you, it is flawed and, yeah, takes the air out of the balloon of the Chopu event, you know? But given that it is what it is, the final did have stakes at Chopu because it is what it is, you know? Imagine they were going back to pipe. Imagine that. I know. Or, or, like... or Chopu being the final event. Like, that yeah. That had all the finals makings right built into it. Um Discussing the final, though, real quickly, Gabriel Medina, who seems like a strategic boss, right? Like, the guy does not make strategic mistakes. And, in fact, pushes strategy to a limit that nobody else is willing to push it to by chandeliering John John's waves in that quarterfinal heat where they had against each other and not getting called on it or paddling directly in front of Baron Mamiya, where Baron Mamiya, like, it just rattles him. Baron then like throws up his hands, doesn't get the call from the judges. And then for the rest of the heat, it feels like Baron is off his game, you know, things like that. One strat strategic mistake that a friend pointed out to me this morning was, did you watch the final? I watched most of it. Yeah. Okay. Gabriel Medina, he was winning for, you know, 30 of the 40 minutes of the final. And like I said, trying to manufacture scores, there was one wave. He got a barrel. He did a big alley-oop when he came out and landed kind of at the top of the wave and then rode out the back of it because he figured, I don't need this score, essentially. I've got my two waves. Jack's on the ropes. I've kind of, you know, I'm just going to ride off the back of the wave. And even Joe Turpel and Felicity Palmatier discussed that, and they're like, why didn't he just ride down? Oh, it's because it doesn't really matter to him. He could do that in his sleep, and also he doesn't need the score right now. If you go back and watch... That would have been the score. Like that riding out of that alley-oop could have been the difference for him to then win the heat because ultimately what it came down to was he lost by 1.67 at the end of the heat. And that out landing, that, getting that barrel, landing that alley-oop would have, that landing that alley-oop was more worth more than two points ultimately. Yeah. And so had he ridden out of it, the score, which didn't go into his bottom, didn't go into his top two. I think his backup score was like a six, eight, seven, and he got a five, eight, seven on that wave without landing the alley oop. So had he landed the alley oop, it would have been a seven point ride, let's say, and that would have been enough for him to win the heat in the end. Jack Robinson's final score would not have flipped the heat if he had that in his bottom line. More over like what he lost, I suppose. If that, if it's all comes down to that, like it's not, you know, whatever. Getting into the final five at position five is neither here nor there. But uh, Gabriel Medina is not on the Olympic team right now. Right. Is he? No. Yeah, it's, it's Philippe and who's second? Joao. Joao. Joao, exactly. So unless Brazil wins the World Games, which I suppose they very well could, and get a third position, uh, yeah, Gabe ain't going to Olympic Chopu. Which... Well, the other thing is Felipe is 
I mean, here's the crazy thing. Here is like this storyline to me is the most. If the World Surf League, they won't lean into it. But I'll, I mean, I suppose it's great. I'll just lean into it. Like the Philippe Toledo as champion, he will come to the Paris Olympics in Chopu as surfing's two-time reigning champion, right? Yes. People at home are going to tune in. Oh, here is surfing's two-time reigning champion out at Chopu. He will get drummed out if there's any waves, even if there's not waves. He will get drummed out in the first or second round. He is, like, his, unless, which, uh, if I was, had resources and whatever, like, if I was a film company, I would go follow uh, him for the year or convince him, you've got to get better at Chopu. This is Olympics. Like, his, his, for those who didn't see it, uh, his performance, again, was abysmal. It was embarrassing. It was shameful for a person of his caliber, a surfer of his caliber and skill, to, like, at this point, it shows, like, a real, uh, what? Like, it's disdainful for Chopu. Like, it's rude to to this way. Well, it... There's a clip that sums it up perfectly in real time, no edits. And it's Felipe Toledo in that heat against Mihamana Bray. Yeah. Uh, needing a score and having priority. And the wave, him and Mihamana are sitting right next to each other. He has priority. The wave comes. Felipe doesn't even make an attempt, doesn't turn and paddle. Mihamana is like tripping out, like, oh, he's not going on this thing spins takes off gets a sick barrel and betters his position betters his score like there was, that was no the best, re- the best wave of that heat yeah and there was no reason for felipe to not go on that or not even they, have a look at it they and they have the uh like all the angles on that one and they played them all of where you see felipe just bobbing out the back in his yellow jersey looking over his shoulder uh like yeah i mean in this perfect position for it with priority needing a score this it was, wasn't like it, he had to paddle over to it. It was right to him. I mean, that's the that's the entire that's the to me sums up Philippe Toledo and his Chopu time. Right? Is for whatever reason, I don't know if it's fear. I don't know if he just doesn't care. I don't know what it is. But problem for you, buddy, is that the Olympics is coming and it's there. And so, if you don't care and and or you are afraid, then you should do the right thing and give your position up. You should, uh, you Gabriel know, I don't Medina know how... would take it and win the event. Yeah, for Brazil and all of it. And so yeah. either, either that or go conquer your fear. I mean, again, I've talked about it on this show before. We had our Beach Grit thing, right? And this was the whole point. This was when Beach Grit basically started. Derek had the great idea of doing the film with, uh, with Philippe. Philippe talking about how real, scared he was. Real quickly, I just power went out i'm gonna lose internet Ooh. oh man can you still see me or hear me i can hear you yeah yeah it says we can't access the video it looks like it's you. still recording you. okay yeah, well i guess let's fun. just keep going wow how'd the power May- go out i have no idea maybe only one circuit went out because my lights went off but the internet still seems to be working well there we go it's a miracle okay, let's just keep going sorry no worries. Sorry that your power's out. Uh, yeah, like, Philippe should... Yeah, we did that. I mean, that whole arc of him, you know, and he refuses to admit or refused then, and I need to reach out to him. I got excoriated in the comments uh, correctly, I think, for not going directly to Philippe, right? And I know Philippe um, blocked as all blocked on his socials and all that, but I really do need to go and say, hey... This You really look scared out there. I don't mean to keep harping on it, and I'm sorry if I'm hurting your feelings about that, but you're giving me year over year, between your zero point heat total there, historic, you got zero points one time, zero points, uh, to your last year getting absolutely schooled by two 50-year-olds, to this year getting, you know, beyond your five point whatever heat total, that one moment right there a wasn't a weird wave it wasn't a confusing wave it wasn't a awkward wave a perfect for the day 
yeah. Chopu Wave came to you. You had priority and you refused to paddle for it. Something is going on. Maybe I'm wrong. Maybe you're not scared, as you say. Then why? What, like, explain to me the process here. Because again, we have one year now. We have exactly one year. Olympics, one year from this time, right? Yeah. We are going to be at Chopu. You are going to be, very likely, the two-time world champion, the sitting world champion, and you are going to make a fool out of yourself on national television around the world. Yeah, international. And what's interesting is you see Caitlin Simmers is 17 years old, She's presumably. But both presumably had never been there before. Charging. Fully charging and, and figuring it out. You know what I mean? And so you see, I understand it's scary, but look at all these people, including... 17 year old who'd never surfed it before showing up and blowing up, you know, facing I'm, their, and by the way, the commentator was even saying like her legs are tore up. Like she yeah. has left skin on the reef and here she is in the finals going for it. I mean, watching them huck and I think Pete Mel talked about it or referenced it about, you know, that's how you figure it out, man. Yeah, you exactly. go over the falls there. Like that's the, you figure it out by just sending it. And again, yeah, that heat to me was, one of the most enjoyable heats of professional surfing all year. Uh, if people are going to go back and watch one heat from this contest or one heat all year, I would suggest Molly Picklum versus Katie Simmers in the, what it wasn't the finals. What was that one? Quarters. It quarters. It is phenomenal. They are both given her. They are yeah. both like, doing, learning, watching the whole thing, watching their, watching natural talent be expanded and tested in real time was, I thought, absolutely fascinating. And then again, juxtaposed to Philippe refusing to go or just being a real wimp. It's like, come on, man. Like, you're not only are you looking foolish, but it's disrespectful, I, I felt, to the wave itself. Well, in... Um... So first of all, congratulations to Jack Robinson and Caroline Marks because they actually did win the event. But Gabriel Medina's performance will be remembered from this event on the men's side and Caitlin Simmer's performance will be remembered from this event on the women's side, despite them coming in second place in their respective heats or respective finals. Um, yeah, Caitlin in the semifinals, she got a nine something on a wave that was showed everything that you're talking about that she had learned against the heat in the heat against Molly and prior she got the wave opportunity. It came to her and she fully executed on that wave in the semifinals. So unfortunately she didn't get the same opportunities in the final against Caroline Marks and the waves actually got a little bit weird in the finals for the women. Like the wind got weird and blustery. And so there weren't as many um, big barrels, but Caitlin being in the finals day at trestles, I feel like she can make a run from fifth position all the way through, especially at a wave like Trestles. Hopefully not this year, man. It's, if, if I mean, nothing against Caitlin Simmers and all great and good to her, but if uh, poor Carissa Moore gets straight robbed again, what's Carissa's standing right now? How much above everyone else is she this year? Is it I'll as to, great I'll as it to. was last year? Uh, it's not as great as Felipe's because I looked it up a couple of weeks ago, but... Um... Give me a second. So Carissa Moore has a total of 62,490 and Tyler Wright is right behind her with 62,065. So about 400 point difference. Okay. So it won't be a robbery this year no. like it was last year. No, but Caitlin has 49,000. So that's a 13,000 point difference. And so that would be a robbery. I mean, Katie could fully make a run, I would imagine, through... Yeah through the trestles she's got the youth she really the energy does. she rips i mean she's kind of got a tough road ahead because um caroline's amazing molly picklin's amazing tyler wright's amazing carissa obviously at lowers so those are all kind of lowers surfers but on the men's side it honestly i mean you're right felipe's dominated out there but griffin colapinto being in second and that being his home break also i like joao chianca for for lowers as well i mean it might be fun like nothing i'm not saying that i ain't gonna watch uh i just think that you've got to beat philippe twice since he's in the and that's that's a tall ask it is 
I did, like I said earlier, I want to read this Griffin Colopinto post because I thought it was really interesting. Did you read it? No. Uh, he just posted it 17 hours ago, so last night. Um, you know, in a world where bravado is the norm uh, for pounding your chest and claiming that you're going to beat everybody and all that sort of stuff. This is a real sign of vulnerability. Griffin Colapinto leaning into vulnerability. And this relates to what I was saying is maybe this is the, the way, way that society needs to evolve. Um, and I, I just, I read this and I'm like, man, this doesn't bode well for Griff. Like you want to be the alpha male telling the other alphas that you're going to, you know, throat stomp them before you go into an event. And this is a totally different direction. And then I thought, wow, maybe this is more actualized and this positions him better. And this shows like a real understanding of uh, a, a deeper understanding. The other ones are superficial. This is a deeper understanding. So anyways, he says, so I come, so I come here to share my experience of quote success. This year I finished second in the world after a full season of 10 events. I look at that on paper and expect to feel an abundance of joy, but for some reason I feel nothing and I can't understand why. So I try to think harder and feel harder, but I only seem to fall deeper into the trap. What's happening? What's this all for? Do I deserve this? Why do I work so hard to feel nothing? Some thoughts that these are some thoughts that I'm having. This develops into unease, low level of anxiety that I can't quite put my finger on. Feeling scared to acknowledge this feeling, distracting myself with randomness to escape that anxiety, and when I'm back with myself, the anxiety is back. Over time, if we don't confront these things, they build and we fall deeper into the trap. So that's uh, so what I'm realizing, and with the help of journaling, meditating, and talking with my spiritual accomplice, Troy Eckert, is that I've tended to look for a result or an achievement to give my feelings to give me feelings of ecstasy, and most of the time, that's not how it works. In the moment of the event unfolding is when we feel the most. That's because we are in the moment, and that's all that we are focused on. But once the moment is over, it's over. So it's the moment... So it's in the moment to moment activities that we feel the best. We can't expect to keep feeling the same joy days after the event by living in the past. So I'm deciding to let go of the attachment to an expected feeling. What's most important is focusing on the tiny details of our day right now to practice sad sadhana, a spiritual practice of life. Every moment is an opportunity to become closer to awareness, awareness of what we are feeling, thinking, speaking, and so on. I'm sharing this because if there's anyone else out there that can relate to this uh, and it can help them realize too what is happening, that's, uh, then that's the important thing to me. Being vulnerable is one of the reasons I'm here, to relate to others and hopefully feel, help us feel not alone. Anyways, the final five is coming soon. And I will be doing my best to enjoy every step of this process. See you guys soon. <laughs> wow. Who would have ever, who, a couple years ago, looking at the slate of up-and-coming professional surfers, who would have ever guessed that Griffin Colapinto would rise to the top as Buddha? Not I. Nope. I mean, I felt like he was just a superficial, fun-loving kid. Yeah, pooping in, his, pooping in the heat and all that kind of stuff. <laughs> yeah, like... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, man, well, powerful words, Griffin Colapinto. Thank you for that. Powerful and true. You know what I mean? Like that's stuff that I'm like, oh yeah, this is great advice for any of us who are living normal lives. But for him to be, you know, assessing that, like I feel like um, the dimension of sports psychology is kind of new to, it's certainly new to surfing. I think it's a decade old for a lot of other sports, but the people who have tapped into that have unlocked longevity in their career, let's say. And so it's relatively new to surfing. And I think that it would be beneficial to surfers, but to see him fully tapping into it and then revealing it on social media is kind of a new thing, certainly for surfing. The trouble for poor Griff is what if he comes to the point where all of this is meaningless, right? This truly is. I mean, surfing is meaningless professional surfing is somehow you're taking something meaningless and sucking even more meaning out of it even though there was no meaning to begin with right i think he i think he identified that by saying 
being vulnerable and sharing the experience is why I'm here. So, but so I guess giving for him competing still gives him joy. And so the, when he's the competing moment, in the moment, it's a fleeting joy. Yeah. So he's saying the competition is a fleeting joy. And what is lasting, my lasting gift would be to share the vulnerability with you guys so that you might be able to experience vulnerability in your life too. That'll be well, the gift. That's the reason. Griffin Colapinto. If Dave Prodan killed surfing, Griffin Colapinto saved surfing. Agreed. Make that sticker. Put yeah. it up at lowers and yep. help that help bolster his efforts. So the question to you is, uh, does this bode well for him compared to the Felipe Toledo iron or a lion on the chest kind of approach? Does this bode well for him at lowers? I think it might, to be honest. I, I, I think. Too. I think that everybody's tried this, you know, I'm just going to keep ramping up the volume. I'm going to keep, you know, saying, you know, being the what? Being the Uberman, being the alpha male out there or the alpha person. And maybe Griffin's approach of like, hey, man, I'm going to flow like water. Can't stop water. It goes where it wants to go eventually is that's that's the way forward. I love it. I'm going. I mean, it makes me want to. If we're going to make picks for lowers right now, I'm going to pick Griffin Colopinto for the men and Caitlin Simmers coming from fifth position for the women. Those are bold picks. You should you should put money down on those picks, I feel. If you got if you got a gut on those, both those would pay out. Yeah, that's true. They probably would. Um I might reassess in the coming weeks, but right now, I just that's where my heart is at. That's where my heart wants to win. Talking about the final 5 real quick. Uh, and I know with HIPAA laws and things like that, the World Surf League is probably not allowed to share too much about their surfer with a broken back, Ethan Ewing. Except for World Surf League, do you think that it is in great taste to celebrate his locking position number three? <laughs> Boom! <laughs> really celebrate the surfer with not one vertebrae broken, but two broken vertebrae in his back and they're celebrating you even ewing so, locked yeah so i saw that he they posted wsl posted on social media that yes he's a lock for the lowers event even though he won't be surfing in it third so, spot i mean he hasn't he hasn't announced that yet you know etc cetera, etc cetera. but come on he, he broke his back there's no way i don't think there's i mean from what i've read i'm no doctor I'm not even Kelly Slater, but uh, the from what I've read in the comments is it's a tough injury and it's a it'll be a lengthy road to recovery. So I just thought that it was the WSL's ineptitude. I thought it was some intern who was running the stats and ran with the social media post. I didn't I didn't think that there was um... malice. Well, there certainly I don't think there was malice, but I also thought it wasn't as if like. They're just saying, oh, we need to acknowledge who's officially qualified for it and make this post. And we, we're just going to choose to leave out the injury part because we'll address that later when he officially withdraws. I just presumed it was complete ineptitude. I mean, but I think the World Surf League's ineptitude at this point is like basically criminal. It's just rude. Like to yeah. just leave it off, right? Like, okay, yeah, he's a lock at three. And for whatever reason, I still have no idea why their rule book reads if one of those five has injured that he's not replaced. Like right. how in the world does the, sure, he's ended the season with that many points, call him third in the world, you know, what at the end of the season, but then yeah. he gets bumped off, everybody gets bumped up and then it would be Gabe who would get bumped in. Right. Which to be perfectly honest, I feel like Gabe has the best shot at dethroning Felipe Toledo. Sure. I mean, yeah, totally. I mean, I think Gabe could actually get into Pip's head. But uh, in any case, if you're the World Surf League, to not only purposefully make it less interesting, purposefully have less people to cheer for and less... I mean, I just don't, I don't get the thinking behind, oh, nope, oh, that's the rules, man. Like right. somehow they, God came down and told Moses that during finals day, if one of the five surfers gets injured, he is not to be replaced. I mean, it's your dumb rule. You change, you change the rule like overnight to let Kelly in there again. Right. So why not just say, oh, we didn't envision for some reason an injury. But We can only then, blame so, Dave Prodan because he's I mean, the he last killed, person in the building. He killed surfing yet again. <laughs> um, 
final talking point about the Chopu event is just, is that the last heat that we're ever going to see Kelly Slater surf? No, for sure. Kelly Slater can't quit. I mean, this is the, this is, again, Matt Warshaw, how I got to know the, the great encyclopedia of surfing, Matt Warshaw, surfing scholar, uh, is, was that he wrote something in the New York Times about how Kelly needed to retire. Like this right. was whatever, 15 years ago or something. And I said, absolutely not. Kelly should never retire. Little did I know that Matt Warshaw was right. I should have known, of course, and he's Matt Warshaw. But uh, watching Kelly, but then again, I take it back. Uh, watching Kelly surf this heat, his heat at Chopu against um, Yago Doro. And That's right. losing in the final seconds and being so depressed. Kelly was ripping. Kelly was absolutely ripping. So I want to see Kelly, I guess, surf pipe. I want to see Kelly surf Chopu. Uh, if the if it was actually a dream tour again and they were going to, say, cloud break, I'd no. want Kelly there. I'd want Kelly at Jeffrey's Bay. I mean, Kelly but could have That's not a practicality. Yago. That's that's not going to happen. You know what I mean? Like, I yeah. agree with you completely. And that was my point of the Instagram post that I talked about posting earlier in the week was Kelly was getting shacked in Namibia at the all-time swell. He had to leave Namibia to go clock in for his day job in shitty surf, as he yep. always does. And so, and by the way, Namibia got better after Kelly left. Like the clips that we're seeing coming out that are like insane were after Kelly left. So he didn't want to leave, but he had to because he has a job to do. And so the kind of the, the purpose of that point that I was making was it's only a matter of time until the John Johns and the Kellys opt out of the CT. Like it's not, you know, the, the Cote's argument of like, yeah, well, he's still, the waves are kind of good and John John still got the 9.57. Yeah, but his brothers are getting 12 point rides around the the calendar year around the globe and so it's a matter of time before john john recognizes we don't the tour doesn't really have any value anymore i certainly don't need the paycheck because i can make a living i'm making a better living all from my other endeavors and i think i'm wasting the best years of my life my fullest potential of my athleticism by surfing crappy waves i think the only reason john john is on tour is to surf chopu olympics and then i think he's done good point i think the olympics retired. have value still the olympics does and for him to go win at chopu i think would be a real defining you know it's, it'd be a a real notch in his belt that's something right and so i think that's the only reason it feels like he's fairly disengaged with the mechanics the thing that dave prodan killed and so i think he's i think he's out the door as soon as olympics are over Got he it. will join his brothers yeah I wouldn't be surprised. I think Gabriel Medina will stick around because he just has, I mean, he loves competition, it seems, as much. And that's why Kelly stuck around for so long. But watching Kelly, you know, not being able to employ his greatest assets and then lose to, you know, just everybody at this point. Losing to everybody at this point is just I mean, a shame. It's like the the Yago, and again, it was discussed uh Across the surf media landscape, but him losing Diago in the ways that he used to beat other people, right? Like the wave just came Diago, right? Where I think whatever that Kelly magic is 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 clearly gone. I mean, he hasn't won a heat since. I mean, he won pipe, you know, whatever was that last year? He hasn't won an event since then, but yeah, he's won heats. He won four yeah. heats this year. <laughs> Yeah, but I mean, it's four total, by the way, four total heats over the year. And he literally served every event except Brazil. Like yeah. he was there for every event, won four heats, you know, it's just, but he can't hang it up. He doesn't know what else to do. Uh, I think like it's such his rote. I mean, it's funny. I, uh, I'm still running thanks to the whoop years. Uh, and I do my lap, right. And it's just become so baked in. Where the other day I was running, I said, I should go that way and run that way instead today. And I just couldn't do it, right? Like, which I feel that's Kelly's life. Kelly's life is baked in of following the tour, and he cannot stop. He's Even if everybody tells him and his mind tells him, we got to, let's go this way. Let's just get off this track. He's like, oh, uh-oh, here I am at the next event for some reason. Yeah, I need to see a Brokeback Mountain meme 
where he, I can't I, quit you. Yep. And it's Kelly and pro surfing. Kelly and Dave Prodan. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, I'm glad you brought up running because that is in barrel or not today. Correct. Um, but I do have two pros in the wild submissions. If you have wonderful, time. wonderful. How's your time today? Great. Okay, good. Uh, if you'll remember, Aaron on Maui is uh, the lead in the lead for the Buell wetsuit for this Rochelle month. Ballard, correct? The Rochelle Ballard story. Uh, can we say that we heard from Rochelle and Bethany last week? We did. We can say that, I think. Yeah, they had, yeah, we're sharing both their pros in the wild. It was very funny that uh, Rochelle was uh, complimenting. Uh, complimenting Bethany on being the real aggressive, yeah, aggressive, angry local, like for, for giving a beat down. Real funny. So Bethany, I think, listened to the show and then shared it with Rochelle. So then Rochelle listened to it and they had a good laugh about the show and appreciated the, uh, the stories. So for those were, who submitted those stories, let it be known that both Bethany and Rochelle appreciated them. Being yeah, shared. totally. How great is that? The full circle. So the, the, our buddy in Maui, Rochelle, you got you got to actually thank her. How good is yeah. that? Amazing. Officially thank her after all these years. Yep. Okay, well, uh, I've got two for you today. They've got to dethrone those if they want to win the wetsuit. Um, Scott in Santa Barbara says, this would have been midwinter, 92, 93, an isolated reefy point break in Santa Barbara County, accessible only by foot, traversing multiple fences, pastures, and security guards. The swell was solid, well overhead, pushing two times overhead on the larger sets. I was attending UCSB and had just recently started working at Channel Island Surfboard Factory. Thus, I had my first ever semi-gun, a 6'8 rounded pin shaped by Al himself with blue hexagons on the nose. The lineup stretched 100 yards, uh, 100s of yards, or hundreds of yards wide beneath steep bluffs. There were a couple of takeoff spots that would shift along the rocky shelves depending on the set. The, large, the surf large enough to make it difficult to see the outside. I caught a wave and promptly lost sight of my buddy that I showed up with. In fact, for the next hour, I saw maybe only two other humans total. Having only ridden ever, only ever ridden shortboards, the 6'8 Al shape granted me an entirely different experience in sizable waves. I was having an all-time session, definitely feeling the magic of Channel Islands and Santa Barbara lore, albeit I was wishing that there was someone else around to share it with. About an hour and a half in, I saw one of the larger sets approaching. It swung towards the ledge that I was sitting on, and with my newfound confidence, I paddled towards the ideal takeoff position. As I stroked into this kelpy dark beast, I saw movement to my left, but just a blur. Definitely something. Right as I began to push up, I turned my head to see it, to see him, impossibly low, impossibly far out into the flats, like he was surfing straight to the beach. Then the board buried an inside rail, fingertips slightly skimmed the water. Tom Curran, in his most iconic bottom turn position, he was staring from 12 feet below, straight up at where I was. So I pulled back, and as I did, the lip vaporized into a million drops of water. All I could see was a Channel Islands logo and the glass on fins flashing before me. I watched it repeat from that a couple, uh, repeat from the back a couple of other times for the rest of the set, uh, the rest of the way down the line. Uh, I sat back in shock for a long while, staring, uh, sorting out what I had just seen. Was it indeed real or just some aberration? My brain couldn't process how I had not seen him how he had just appeared as I had distinctly watched the wave approach the entire way, and my brain certainly couldn't process the speed that he was moving at. Well, I never saw Curran again that day. When I met up with a buddy back on the beach, he had not seen Curran at all. Since then, I've worked with Tom, I've worked and surfed with Tom more times, but that introduction seems fitting. It seems so Tom. How is he certain that it was Tom? Great if question. If no friend saw him, if he didn't see him before or after, how was it not just the ghost of Tom Curran? It very well could have been. We don't Which know. Is, and if anybody's going to have a ghost while they're alive, it would be Tom Curran. So 
I <laughs> totally true. This is the most current. By the way, current stories are by and I mean by a long margin the most frequent submissions for pros in the wild. I have not read all of the current stories. I would say though, thirty to forty percent of all submissions are current, current stories. stories. And this <laughs> is this is the perfect example of it because. I mean, remember CJ Hobgood actually called in and said, I was on a mental, I was on a boat trip in Indo and I never, he was on the boat with us and I never saw him. Yeah. <laughs> like he just is, or he isn't, or you think you saw him and maybe you didn't, but nobody else is there to verify it. And this is the perfect example of it is Scott's in position for the wave. He knows he has f freedom to go. And yet at final Tom glance, Curran. Tom Curran doing a bottom turn, an iconic Tom Curran bottom turn, and then ripping the wave and never see him again. I mean, it's wild. It is a wild story, a well-done story, helping to cement the legacy of the world's most interesting surfer besides Conan Hayes. And bravo, but I'm going to say Rochelle, still number one. All right, cool. Rochelle keeps it then. Uh, Rochelle and Aaron. Um by the way, that was from Scott Anderson, who's the president at Channel Islands. Oh, Scott Anderson. Phenomenal <laughs> story. I was like, Scott, this is clearly the way that you wrote this story. It's a poetic love letter to Channel Islands, first I mean, of all. And the building of the lore of Tom was also baked in and the building of the lore of Santa Barbara. But you won me over. It's a beautiful story. I'm going to read it for you. That's a great story. Yeah. You earned it. You earned it. Your poetry earned the organic Channel Islands commercial into the I, middle of the show. I really feel bad, and the and the listener at home or on the car in the car, wherever they may be, knows that this is. I would re, I would really like to give a wetsuit to somebody who lives in Santa Barbara, Perfect. rather than someone who lives in Maui. To be honest, yeah. but yeah, what are you gonna do? What are you gonna do? Uh, all right. Well, you might be giving one to somebody to Solid Rod living in Indonesia. <laughs> He definitely doesn't need one, but let's go. Okay, so after submitting a story that was set in northern Baja, where a group of female surfer of female pros paddled out into the frigid water in bikinis for a photo shoot with a big moke named Ray blocking for them, Solid Rod submitted that story. That was the main bulk of the email. And it was a decent story, but I wasn't going to read it. In his postscript, he then sent this addendum story which I'm going to actually be reading as the main submission. He said, Another possible addition for your show could be underground slash unknown chargers or something like that. Living, surfing, and traveling in Indo, I've come across so many crazy hardcore rippers that no one knows about. I suppose it would be impossible to do this, but it just seems like these guys deserve some recognition. Just last week, I was on an island in East Indonesia when the swell really kicked in. And it was clear that only the hardcore could or would get waves. I was staying at a heavy left reef point and never did I surf with more than 15 people in the water. I saw many broken boards, leashes, reef rashes, and one guy nearly ripped his palm off. Anyway, the day was, this day was after the biggest day. An older eccentric South African that was sleeping in a tent at our homestay. He convinced another bloke to paddle out with him to film him surfing with a mandolin. Yes, surfing while holding and playing a mandolin. This eccentric South African frantically worked for over an hour to strap a GoPro uh, on and arrange his mandolin so that he could paddle in, pull into the barrel, and then swing around the mandolin and play it while he's getting barreled. We were all skeptical to say the least. As they were pulling away um, on rattling motorbikes, we noticed that he was actually missing his middle thruster fin. <laughs> we said, hey, Bugsy, you forgot your fin. And he said, nah, I don't need it. He hastily replied, more skepticism and snickers from us. But boy, we were wrong. As evident from the footage that was taken uh, from the guy on the longboard that he talked into paddling out on the channel to film him. Bugsy was nonchalantly pulling into heavy barrels and then swinging his mandolin around and playing it, all while riding a regular shortboard with no trailer fin in it. It was insane. He was surfing waves that 75% of the people staying in the area were not qualified for, all while playing a mandolin with two fins in his thruster. 
While I believe that Bugsy has pulled this clip from his Instagram, he does have similar other clips from the Mentawaz with, uh, Mentawaz with similar exploits. Check it out on Instagram at Bugsy Bazatone. There's two Zs, B-A-Z-Z-A tone on Instagram, Bugsy Bazatone. He says that he will make a million dollars one day and I have no, and I doubt him no more. His ability and gusto is undeniable. Anyways, hope you guys can use this to further engage with your listeners. If not, no problem. Keep work, get barreled. Solid Rod. Solid Rod. That is an epic tale, Solid Rod. I love it so much. And I'm going to, I'm going to follow now, Buzzy. Bugsy. 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 Bugsy Bazitone. Yeah, Bugsy Bazitone. I actually went to his account, and sure enough, it's kind of a thing for him. And it wasn't just a mandolin. He had multiple different stringed instruments that he's playing while he's surfing. Oh, that's epic. I'm only going to say that uh, this is pros in the wild. When we do the segment Hardcore Locals in the Wild, or har- a Hardcore Local segment, which could be its own segment. I do love it. Yeah, I mean, There's something great. there for sure. Completely. But yeah, I'm just going to say uh, Rochelle still wins purely based on her pro being more pro than Buzzy. I got it. I agree. In the Rochelle story, if we read them, the thing is the freshness of the story makes you want to deem it a winner. But if we went back and actually played them side by side, I think the Rochelle story has got a bit more punch. Yep. So. Agreed. All right. Aaron keeps it. Rochelle keeps it. Thank you for your submissions. Send them to surfsplendor at gmail.com or feel free to call them into the listener line. Um, listener line number is one seven six zero two three seven zero one five zero, or you can find it on surfsplendorpodcast.com. All right, Chaz, let's go to commercial break, and then we will be back with, of course, Barrel or Nah. Let's do it. All right, Chaz, we're back from commercial um, where people got to listen to hear about LinkedIn.com slash surf. What, are people going to be self-employed? I mean, be living Live large it. at self-employed? You know, they are going to go from living large at self-employed to employed with the best job that they ever could have imagined for themselves because of LinkedIn's incredible hiring network. Fantastic. <laughs> And you and I, we didn't mention, but we're fueled by drinkag1.com slash surf always, every day. Got the wife on the program, finally. Took me this long to get the wife on the program, but she's on the program. Is she firing on all cylinders? Never been. Deals are just, like, flying into the window. That's why she's answering all of her emails and her LinkedIn messages, and you're not. Exactly. Uh, All right. Well, barrel or not... um, Coming off of last week's, we mentioned having tons of feedback from last week's um, sitting shotgun as a male. Somebody said, quote, being married for over 25 years, I am more than happy to have my wife drive. I spent many a year being berated on how terrible my driving is. Judge all you want. Life is good in the passenger seat. Love the work. Keep up. Uh, keep working. <laughs> Love the chef. Yeah. Good note. Somebody else commented, too. They're like... Um, It's the princess position, and it feels great to be the princess. A male commented, like, that is kicking back. I could drink all I want at dinner. I get to kick back. I could take naps on long drives. You guys are tripping by trying to hold the power, the position of power. He's, I mean, all of this is true. Like, this is, again, this is a me problem. This is an internal tick that is uh, broken. Yep. Well, here comes a call in uh, related to that. David, Chaz, this is Chris from Jersey calling in for the grit in response to your recent barrel or not nah around riding shotgun to your either wife or girlfriend. Uh, there's one aspect you guys did not address, and that is what type of car are we talking about here? Uh, for example, I have a Tacoma, got bigger wheels on it, little camper shell, you know, it's the adventure rig. The gas mileage sucks. During the week, I'm not driving that thing. So, you know, being a two-car household, I'll take my wife's car, which is a little, uh, it's a little crossover type deal. Definitely would be interpreted more as a woman's car. And I'm usually riding shotgun at that. So here's the thing, like, what's worse, riding shotgun in, like, a Kia Soul? Or actually driving the Kia Soul. Want to hear your thoughts? Keep up the work. 
great, great question. A great question. Entirely good question. Feminine cars, masculine cars, and he brings up and like because of course if you are riding a shotgun in the Subaru Outlander, then your wife is a lesbian. Is that Uh, a car? No. Outback. (laughs) Outback. That's what it is. Just kidding. The Subaru lesbian thing. It's not a very funny joke. Uh, Sorry, I stepped on it anyways by no, reading. By it's all good. But, uh, but uh, the trying to, I was trying to think of a, of a classically feminine car. Well, uh, a, uh, he nailed, I mean, a Jetta, missile. let's say. Jetta. Uh, yeah, so is it, I mean, because if you're shotgunning your Jetta, then everybody clearly knows that that's your girl's car. If you're driving the Jetta, then people think, oh, you, brought, you, you know, bought a Jetta. Um, hmm. I'm, I'm gonna say uh yeah i'm gonna say it's barrel to ride shotgun in girly cars all right for a man yeah i mean it's it, what's worse is the question riding shotgun in it or because neither of them are barrel it's and this isn't a barrel and hot by the way this is just a feedback from last week but what's the worst position is either being shotgun in the kia soul or driving the kia soul i'm gonna say driving the kia soul is worse worse yeah i agree yeah i agree and that's right i mean and if you're uh, it is a little bit difficult to assign a gender to a car, but there's a lot of females who drive, let's say, a Volkswagen Jettas in Southern California. And what's worse is if they adorn them. They might yeah. have eyelashes on the headlights or the something, you know, dangling off of the rear view mirror, something that marks it as a female's Clearly car. F- feminine car. In that case, you want to be in the shotgun position. It's really true. It's really totally. true, and I'm and I'm glad that this got this wrinkle got thrown in because it's an yeah. important one. Exactly. There was a bunch of other wrinkles that people threw in. They're like, you know, my wife uh, Miguel from the Canary Islands is like, I think he said his wife's from Peru. They go down there. It's nightmare to drive in Peru, so she knows those roads and that pattern of traffic differently. So she drives when they're in Peru, but when they're at home in the Canaries, he drives. All okay. sorts of stuff like that. Um, okay, but as it relates, you mentioned running earlier in the show. I got an email a month ago from PR person who's uh, for Vivo Barefoot, whatever. John John's John, new John John's new sponsor. Yeah, John John's new thing. He's got three three shoes that he's doing with them, and they're like, "Hey, you know, we want to send you a pair of shoes and whatever." And I'm like, "Oh, cool." And they're like, "In inter- you should interview the founder of the company, who's like focused on barefoot running, you know, and these shoes are made to support barefoot. They protect your feet, but they're essentially like you're be- running barefoot." I'm like, man, is it worth it for a $200 pair of shoes if I got to interview this guy? <laughs> you know yeah. what I mean? And I'm like, yeah, you know what? Keep the shoes. Uh, no thanks. Um, but running barefoot is the question. You're a runner. There's a whole thing. There's a whole movement for running barefoot. So barrel and all running barefoot. Oh, my goodness. I mean, I would have thought. So, you know, like the those like what the who are the great uh kenyan runners right like they all they run barefoot in kenya i think a bunch but then they like you never see them in a marathon running barefoot i don't think right so there must be value to running in shoes so i'm gonna say no barrel i'm gonna say running barefoot is a gimmick i want to know more (laughs) i should just read one of the, the book that was written on it or whatever um because they the idea of like being grounded and connected to the earth and all that, like there is something there that is interesting to me. And I think that that's where the Vivo guy is like, okay, there's something here that's interesting, but you need to protect your feet from, you know, glass in the street or whatever it is. Well, I mean, here's the thing though. If, If being barefoot is all so great, which again, I totally like being in the earth, right? Like being, touching the soil all this i totally get and i am a fan of running around barefoot around the home like not actually running but if i'm doing a thing that requires shoes i don't get the point of these barefoot shoes right like uh on any way like if you're putting a shoe on then you're defeating the purpose so then the shoe should a be comfortable and b protect your foot right like which again kid was one of those kids who rarely ever wore shoes went to like hippie preschool so didn't have to wear shoes to preschool you know like was barefoot 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 
And I always thought, this is great. She's getting really strong feet from this, and this is a good thing, right? If you choose to be barefoot. And I think she does have really strong feet and all that, but her ballet teacher will excoriate her if she comes in in anything other than like a highly cushioned, you know, shoe, like, or Crocs. Like, they're allowed to wear Crocs because the way your foot moves in Crocs, I guess, is good for it, and it's super comfy. But she's always, ballet teachers saying, your feet in ballet, your feet are your tool. Protect your tool, right? Yeah. What are you doing? And that made me think, oh, yeah, you know, if it comes to, if a ballet teacher is saying protect these things, don't just run around barefoot because it strengthens your feet, protect them, then yeah. there must be something to protection. So I'm going to say, again, it sounds like a gimmick, no barrel. It sounds like there's benefits to running barefoot and there's benefits to shoes. And the benefits to shoes are tremendous and the benefits for running barefoot are narrow. Yeah. Right? <laughs> it's like, yes. yeah, there you tap into the earth, right? But then you're subject to stepping on glass and then, you know, your knees are going to get ruined because you don't have the cushion or whatever yeah. it is. And so it's like, okay, I see there are some benefits. But dang, those benefits to shoes are like 99% benefit. Uh, I So I ran, I have an old pair of shoes that I've been running in and they've been a little bit problematic. And then the other day I did something wrong and my knees just I shot. Ran, oh my God. I got home from my run and I was like, my knees, I had to ice them and they still hurt the next day. So I got a brand new pair of shoes that I just wore this morning for the first time. Phenomenal. Back in the game. Yeah. I mean, were, the moment I put them on, I got, I'm like, the, they're Hoka's, yep. which I think we've talked about in the past. But I'm like, these things are so good. This is like the perfect shoe for running and or for my foot, I guess, for running. And uh, yeah, this morning's run, no issues with my knees whatsoever. Felt amazing. Yeah, no. Barefoot is not the way to go. And yeah. also on a, you, you tapped into a great or interesting thing, like I will regularly get the PR emails too of a pair of sunglasses or, you know, this, that, or the other thing. And, you know, great for all the entrepreneurs out there going out, starting businesses, you know, yeah. these small businesses love it all. But like the, uh, lift of, I don't know what they think. Like, I don't know what they think I do. The thought of writing an article or interviewing someone on a podcast or et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, for a free pair of sunglasses. I mean, if Louis Vuitton was going to send me and said, hey, we're going to send you, you know, uh, we got this new trunk coming out or something, you know, this fancy bag. Would you interview? I'd say, great. That is a stinking $3,000 bag all day, every day. For the $50 pair of sunglasses, I will, pull, you can buy advertising. There's this thing called, I'm a small business right. too, man. You can buy advertising. But yeah. Your thing is not worth it for me. I, I would look foolish writing about it to begin. How am I going to tie it into something? All of a sudden, I'm going to say, "Oh, there's this new pair of sunglasses that doesn't have arms." Great, right? Like, right. I mean, well, she said the PR woman said like the founder of the company is a surfer, and you know all all of these kind of tie-ins to our world. Fine. But even still, even still, Fine. I was like, Fine. yeah, Fine. that's all. Yeah, exactly. That's an hour long interview, maybe a usually a ninety minute long interview. I'm not sure that uh, a pair of barefoot my, shoes. Well, I'm, more importantly, like my listeners want to hear, you know, a certain quality of insight into the context of the world that we're discussing from week to week. And I'm not sure this fits in. Why did John? It's his first shoe sponsor in a long time, if I am correct. And it was funny to me that this is what he chose. Like John, John Florence, I guess is nothing if not unique odd oh yeah i don't think it's so much a shoe sponsor it's like he has three shoes a line of shoes with them you know three different shoes for his lifestyle and so that's more of the deal i don't think it's just a sponsor relationship like it is with so many others hmm. um by the way somebody pointed out something funny about they're like you guys do kook or curran because curran is so far out there that like you know, he then reconnects on the other side of the planet with kooks. Even yeah. though they're on opposite sides, they're like touching uh, hands. Yep. Um, they're like, Kelly is bet. It should be Kelly Slater or Curran. Or I'm sorry, Kelly or Kook. Um, because Kelly's equally as crazy. But like Tom Curran, he wears the visor with socks sewn onto them to cover his ears from the sun. 
but he doesn't try to sell it to you. Yeah, you know, like that's true. he does it for himself. Kelly having a moon, uh, myrtle, turtle moon <laughs> sandal, <laughs> a turtle moon sandal. I like turtles. <laughs> is crazy, as Tom Curran's is, but then he tries to sell it to you. Yeah, I mean, I like, think he's Tom, become more Curran than Curran. I think Tom knows that he beat or dances moves to the beat of his own drummer. Kelly doesn't know that. I think Kelly, I don't know what, Kelly's self-awareness is strange, I think. Yeah. Yeah, there is something there, though. We'll develop that into yep. a future concept. That's good. Uh, barrel or not, number two, this came from a listener. Posting on social media to alert that you're taking a break from social media. No, Barrel. Like, using social media for really anything other than the occasional making people laugh, Looking at, you know, the occasional post of children, the occasional, like, social media is good for one thing and one thing only, basically. And it's to semi-keep up with your extended circle, right? You can tap in and or, I will also say, the secondary is to get information, uh, informational. And tertiary art or something, music, right? I was going to say tertiary laughing at memes. Yeah, laughing at memes. I mean, laughing at memes is probably primary, to be honest. But uh, like any, the thing to not do on social media is be serious and self self uh, involved. See Joan Hill's ex, Sarah Brady, who I think she's gone quiet. Let's see. No, she, post she posted something like two days ago in a bikini doubling down on the fact that oh, no. this is I an saw... old bikini shot that I'm reposting because uh, now I, I saw that her I saw that her uh... yeah she hasn't done it she's story free for the last like 48 at least hours oh maybe the last 48 but a couple days ago she was still posting and it was a bikini thing but I don't know it's as quiet as I've seen her go in a while but in any case to be crazy self-involved on social media is not the thing to be that's the one thing not to do I suppose there's a lot of things to do there's one real thing not to do and it's that. And uh, yeah, like, and so telling people, like anyone cares. Who cares? Just take your dang break. Um, Nobody cares. So it is amazing that you think you need a break from social media. And so you're going to engage on social media to tell everybody that you're taking a break. But the other one that I like is when people come back from the break and they go, hey, back. I'm back. I just took a little hiatus. It was much needed. You should take time off social media. And I'm like... I didn't even know you were missing. No. I so mean, that's like, the thing. who gives a crap? This is all about you. Yeah. You know? the, the, again, the self-involvement, the complete yeah. unaware that everybody that you think somehow that social media has clicked your brain, that you think people care, right? right? That you think people genuinely, I mean, they might care about you in a passive, shallow way. Yeah. They like, they weren't wondering where you went. And now that you're back, and especially the way the algorithm goes, the fact that it's not linear anymore. And so you could get the, I'm taking a break and I'm back, Instagrams fed to you algorithmically in the same exact scroll, right? Like right. there's no rhyme or reason to the way, or I'm sure there's a rhyme or reason, but nobody knows it. It's not like it's, yeah, chronological. Right. Yeah. Pretty silly. Uh, don't do it. That's definitely a no barrel. No barrel. Speaking of memes and Jonah Hill, you saw the the photos of him looking super, super slim, right? The yep. paparazzi photos where he's like Very. smiling, looks so happy. Yep. Somebody made a meme and they said, that feeling when your girlfriend is not surfing with men. <laughs> 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 and he's just beaming. That's real good stuff. Yeah. The, in the internet remains undefeated, dude. I mean, very, very always funny. Always funny. All right, final barrel or not. Nah. Botech, Botox for men. Mm, no barrel. No barrel. I, I have a, I won't say who, close friend uh, who's getting talked into it from his wife. And he absolutely does not need it. He absolutely is too young to ever need it. And he's going for it because his wife is into it and, that, and she makes him think that he needs it. And I'm like, God dang. First of all, hell no. And secondly, how am I even finding out about this? You should never admit this publicly. If you are doing this, the fact that this is now public conversation is shameful. Like, Absolutely shameful. Insane, right? I mean, I think 
publicly, any pampering, and I've said this before, any pampering for a man is a no-barrel. From manicures and pedicures to, like, the most pampering you as a man are allowed to do is get your hair cut. Uh, what about, every what once about your while, expensive Gucci loafers? That qualifies as pampering. Well, but that's, like, quality stuff. That's quality <laughs> of life right there. Uh, that's I'm, I'm talking about, like, sure, buy yourself nice stuff. That's, that's fine. But uh, don't, like, have procedures done to you. Besides, you get your hair cut, and every once in a while, you get a nice hot shave, right? When was the last time you had a towel-in-the-face hot shave? I don't think ever. Oh, wow. I mean, yeah, it's hard. It's weird to get here because you have to go to, like, a fussy barber, I think. Like, yeah. Middle East or whatnot, right? They're just everywhere. Like, you can just go get your shave. feels good. In any case, facials, no. Uh, any kind of anything, Botox, definitely no. Zero. He's going to regret it so badly, your poor friend. He's going to come out with a shiny forehead. Is it for forehead wrinkles or what's it for? I think so. Yeah, I think it is. He's going to come out with like a billboard shiny forehead and it's going to be awkward. And he's, gonna, his I'm wife gonna, is going to, or girlfriend is going to stop liking him. I agree with that too. I'm like, yeah. whatever the, um, I don't know, perceived goal here is, will not get executed. And in fact, it'll create this perpetual uh, slide downward of like trying to chase this thing that you are now never going to chase again. You just never need to step on the slippery slope. I am going to send him Griffin Colapinto's post you because should. that's what this is about. This is chasing this thing that will always be fleeting and thinking that catching it will make you feel a certain way. You not. should never be chasing it. You should figure out what it is that you're trying to feel and then do something meaningful that will embed that feeling deep within. You know what I mean? But the superficial thing and going and getting the needle in your face to try to make you feel a certain way is just the wrong thing. And actually being convinced into it by somebody else worse is embarrassing. I mean, and by significant other, more embarrassing. I mean, I know. That's not what she, she doesn't like that. She th may think she likes that. She might think she wants you to look like, you know, whatever, Brad Pitt or something, right? Like, and so she has this image in her mind, but that image is not you with Botox. It's Brad yeah. Pitt and exactly. those twain shall never meet. Yeah. And so what you can do though is attitudinally adjust and be cooler or be more, you know, something like yeah. what she wants is not a shiny foreheaded man. That's right. what she thinks she wants. I know. I was really aghast. Yeah. And I was like, wait, is this Shocking. a thing? Like, are dudes getting Botox I now? And I would love for somebody to call in. Like, I know that some people get Botox for migraines, I think. So if That's you're right. doing it, if you're doing it for m medically somehow, then that's one thing. But if you're doing it cosmetically, for shame. But I would love a caller to, so, you know, as Surf Equity points out, sometimes we're not all together right. So if you're a man who has had Botox, Colin. Well, we've only discussed male and female Botox. How do you feel about non-binaries getting Botox or other identifying getting Botox? Should we include everybody in this conversation? Can we go for another 45 minutes just talking about all variations of the rainbow? I think and, we should. And how, how Botox relates to them? I think we should. Exciting. Okay. okay. <laughs> Strap that's in. What, that's the show everybody wants. <laughs> um, all right. Well... Send the emails to chaz at beachgrit.com. Yep, please. Thank you. Please and thank you. Um, all right. Slash well, Puppets of the Manosphere. We should really change the name of the show to Puppets of the Manosphere. I also, by the way, <laughs> that would be a way better show. That is a way better name. Um, the other thing that you mentioned at the top of the show is them stop dead naming me or whatever it is. I'm like, barrel or not, complaining when people get your name wrong. I mean, like, hey, I mean, it, I understand like the plight of the community. And so the dead naming thing has kind of a weight to it that I don't understand because I've never lived with that. But good God, somebody, good somebody, God, somebody in the comments, like hit it exactly on the head. They're like, this is not my issue. But uh, dead naming is for the trans community, something that really is impactful, right? It's like yeah. it's used uh what like aggressively by family members or whatever to basically shame you know yes. this transition person yeah. and surf equity 
is using this whole issue to talk about their their brand shift, right? Right. Like, which is, I mean, Mike, if you care about exactly. the plight of trans people, to make a mockery, to use the a, something that's really painful as we've rebranded. We're not painting, you know, our, our name isn't red anymore. It's blue. Uh, like, I mean, it, it was shameful. Shame I mean, on surf equity. That's exactly it. This is, the phrase dead naming was created for a very purposeful thing that you just talked about. It was an intentional, your family intentionally insulting you, yeah. you know, to shame you. They're using it in the equivalent of, my name's Kirsten, not Kristen. Yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean? And then telling you, like, how dare you call me Kirsten? This is the equivalent of my parents. You know, like, that's the way that it was being used. I'm like, oh, my gosh. Wait, this, the whole thing is so weird about them, which I'm really confused, too, why they're, again, what, it was the Committee for Equity and Women's Surfing, and now it's Surf Equity, all fine and good. But I still don't understand why, like, why their target 90% of the time and 90% of their ire is directed at women. Like they, it's really a woman hating organization, which is super bizarre. Yeah. Bethany. Bizarre. They hate Bethany. Yep. I don't get any Kelly of it. <laughs> I don't get any of it. Yep. It's all, but I am a clearly, pop. yeah, clearly cisgendered. Um, what is it? Cisgendered white male. But what, yeah, but what is the other? Oh, puppets of the manosphere. Puppets of the manosphere. So yep. that's why I don't understand anything anymore, but yep. whatever. All right, man. Hey, good show. Good show. Go to uh, beachgrid.com. Go to surfsplendorpodcast.com. Thank you for all the support. Thank you to our sponsors, by the way. Buell, I didn't even mention. Well, I referred to them, obviously, giving away the wetsuit at the end of the month. But buellsurf.com is where you go for all your wetsuited needs. Uh, Veyer Watches is where you go for all your watch needs. And, of course, drinkag1.com for all of your health and wellness needs. Anything else going on, Chaz? I think that's it. I think we're... Ticking down to trestles. You're going to be in town for lower trestles. Yeah, we will be in town, but I will not be going to the event. Mm. I can't remember if I'm going to be in town or not, but if I am, it's the eighth, you say? Yeah. So we'll have two shows before then. Okay, great. Well, I'll we'll beat be the dead. We'll beat the dead horse before then. Oh, great. All right, man. Until next week. Bon voyage.